here a population that lives on a continent, on the mainland, right? And then we have little islands. And in fact, we very commonly see this in the biological world, where we have very closely related species and islands um, in front of the mainland uh, that have somehow that seem to have diverged from that mainland population. And the way that this came about is that we have just a few individuals that maybe throughout a major storm or something like that got rafted on some sort of debris or whatever across that ocean and just by chance got to that island. It's a rare, rare, rare event. It doesn't happen very often at all. Uh, but these two happen to have uh, made it and are now the founders, right, the founding population uh, uh, for this new population on that little island. Of course, the environment that these uh, uh, new individuals just arrived at might actually be somewhat different from the environment on the mainland where that main population uh, lives as well, right? Uh, for example, it can have different kinds of vegetation on it or the food can be, obviously the food has to be similar enough that these individuals can, can find a food source, otherwise they would starve and our population would die. But the food that they do find might be slightly different, right? And so for example, maybe it's, uh, you know, the, our population needs to eat seeds or needs to eat fruit and maybe these seeds that are on this island are somewhat larger so it's harder to crack them with a little mouth of uh, whatever they were before right and so you can imagine just that there is different kinds of selection pressures that can now actually um, uh, confront our new population in this new environment where individuals can uh, it might actually now have a reproductive advantage that have different heritable traits right um, compared to individuals uh, uh, in the mainland population, right? And so that we can actually now in our new population have a new direction in which selection wants to favor individuals with a particular heritable trait, simply because they are more able to take advantage of these new resources that are uh, predominantly available in this new habitat, in this new environment, right? And so um, if we take a look back at natural selection, there is in fact multiple different kinds or modes of selection that can take place. The example that I just gave, we just went to a new environment and suddenly the environment is, is, is somewhat different, right? So there is now very strong selection for individuals, if we go back to the seed size, for example, that have mouths or whatever that are big enough to deal with those seeds, right? Um, whereas most of the individuals in our mainland population actually were dealing with smaller seeds, right? So we have a new selection pressure where the fitness is actually now higher for individuals that uh, uh, um, on the high end of the variation in terms of beak or mouth size or something that can deal with it, right? In, uh, rather than the, the, the mean or the average of that little founder population that we had. So that the, uh, our population over multiple generations will have more and more and more individuals simply because of the increased reproductive success of our biggest mouthed individuals in this case, right, to move in a certain direction, right? And so what we have just set up is a directional selection pressure into one direction so that if we now follow our population, our new population in that little island, over time, we will see that they are starting to, to, to differentiate in one direction, right? If we come back year after year, we might find that the average size of mouth sizes among individuals in that population shifted because of the higher fitness of individuals with a larger mouth size. Compared to this new environment that, that our founder population there is now experiencing, right, individuals that remain on the mainland are in an environment that they have experienced now for, for millennia already, right, for thousands and thousands of years, and where selection has already played out with respect to the local uh, uh, selection pressures that are, uh, uh, you know, present, for example, in our case, seed size, perhaps, right, where we have these smaller seeds, so that most of these individuals have already a mouse size that can deal very well uh, with that particular particular seed size, right? So on the mainland actually, and this is what we usually find when we, or very commonly find in populations uh, uh, that we sample, is that we don't usually find directional selection uh, uh, or very strong selection, uh, uh, directional selection in most populations, but instead a different uh, uh, mode of selection, which we call stabilizing selection, which is most of the individuals already have a phenotype right, uh, that, that maximize fitness for the particular select, uh, selection pressures that are in, in the uh, environment at large. And so if we have now variation, which we always have, right, among individuals, either to the one extreme or towards the other extreme, both of those will have reduced fitness uh, um, uh, 
uh, compared to uh, to the individual individuals along the mean, right? The average size for or whatever trait uh, that we're looking at. And so in those cases, our pop, uh, the selection actually decreases the variance because it decreases the number of individuals on both extremes uh, that that will reproduce and and leave viable offspring in the next generation, right? So that we decrease the variance and simply hone in on 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 on, on that one particular uh, trait and make it more and more and more common in that particular population. So we have a certain bug that lives in North America, it's called a soapberry bug, that happens to be feeding on, on soap berries, right? And what it does is it, it, it wants to go for the seed in the center of the fruit. It doesn't care about the fruit at all, it just wants to get to the seed. Well, the seed is pretty far down, and the only way for it to get there is by drilling down through all of that fruit to get to the seed with a very long proboscis, right? Now, in 1940, a different kind of soapberry was introduced that was not native in the United States, was introduced into the United States, that becomes available now as a food source to these soapberry bugs as well. Right? But these, this is a new kind, a new species that these soapberry bugs have never seen before. Right? And in fact, their fruit is somewhat different. The fruit is smaller. And it actually becomes uh, much harder for these soapberry bugs with a very, very long proboscis to even be able to still hold on to the fruit with that long thing and still trying to, you know, you have to really, you know, stretch back to get your proboscis into that, into that fruit to get into that seed with these much, much smaller seeds. Their proboscis is simply too long to deal efficiently with this particular food source. So as you can see on this graph here, we have this wide separation between the radius of the fruit, right, which they have to penetrate through to get to the seed, which sets up different uh, selection pressures for individuals if they want to now attain, you know, be, with their proboscis go down and, and access that seed on the, on the big fruit versus the one to, to access the little one. By today, what we are seeing now, when we start looking and sampling out at soap, uh, soap berries, bugs, right, we see now that they have a bimodal distribution in terms of beak length. There are some individuals that are predominantly of the very long type, and there's very, very few intermediates. And then we have another uh, 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 high number of individuals that have very, very uh, 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 small beak lengths. Try to explain what happened in those intervening years. The answer to this, of course, is that the environment that is now available to these, to these different, uh, uh, or to these bugs, to these soapberry bugs, has two different modes that are very, very different. Now, the soapberry bugs almost certainly had some kind of genetic variation to begin with that determined the length of their proboscis, right? And which one, the one with the longer or the shorter one, was able to either take advantage of the big fruit or the little fruit, depended on which fruit it was trying to eat in the first place, right? And so there is now different selection pressures on the individuals that are trying to eat the large fruit and individuals that are trying to eat the small fruit. And in fact, both of those are favored. No one is favored that has intermediate length uh, uh, beak sizes, right? So we have now um, higher fitness of individuals that are at both extremes of the range of variation, the ones that have very large uh, uh, beak length, right, uh, or proboscis length, and very, very short proboscis length with very low fitness of individuals uh, uh, in between, right? So we call this now, when we start selecting towards these extremes, we call this disruptive select, uh, selection, where the phenotypic trait starts actually being favored and evolving from one generation to the next into two opposite directions.